the primary type um, of 3D printer that you'll see um, hobbyists kind of like us would, would have. Uh, that uses a material, generally a, a plastic, and the printer deposits the material in layers and uses heat to fuse those layers together. Uh, then there's also stereolithography and digital light processing, which uses lasers and a light sensitive resin to create um, to create the parts. And then there's selective laser sintering, which uses uh, various powders and a laser. So it's sort of similar to SLA and DLP, but a little bit different at the same time. So I'm going to skip a little more in-depth information on FDM because I have a live demo for the FDM printer um, at the end of this. So I'm going to jump to SLA and DLP first. And like I had said, um, they use a high power laser and a light sensitive resin to create the object. In SLA, the laser will trace the path of each layer. So it's kind of a, a cool process to watch. And I have a, a demo of that as well to show. Um, kind of similar to how traditional FDM printers work. Um, and then DLP, and the reason that they're kind of lumped in with SLA printers is because it's the same process, but instead of tracing a path, it will project the entire layer in one flash of light, which will cure the entire layer. So it's faster to do that, but it loses a little bit of quality on the, uh, the finished print. So just a quick demo of how SLA works. You've got the resin in the tank on the bottom. And then as the printer runs, the resin is hardened um, layer by layer to make the final shape. So as this says here, this little piece was a five hour print. Um, see if people make stormtrooper helmets. That's, yeah. This, I got some stuff to show, so it's, it's kind of ironic you, you said uh, the Stormtrooper helmet there in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, so the SLA printer, so it's a very small part, but it took five hours. But the print quality is, is phenomenal on it. So you're, with, with this, you're making a trade off of quality for time. But again, it's a, it's a pretty cool part. So pause there for a second. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? real quick. Um, oh. And if you hear the sound of a, uh, well, it sounds like a, a jet taking off. It's the uh, the demo printer I have here. It's, I have it preheated, so you can just kind of jump right in with that. Um, so hopefully that's not too, too loud. Um, Yeah, so which 3D print type is most popular and has the best quality? Um, FDM is the most popular. Um, it's the most affordable. It has the most designs available to it um, because that patent did expire. So everyone can really contribute to the designs. Um, so FDM would be the most popular. 
but in terms of best quality, it's probably SLA or SLS. Um, it, it'd be between those two. Um, but the cost of those is a lot higher generally. So it's kind of a trade, another set of trade offs versus um, you know, of time and, and money versus quality. Um, so for selective laser centering, it's again, very similar to SLA, but instead of using a liquid resin, it'll use a powder. Um, generally, SLS is seen um, when there, it's a metal powder being used, but nylon is another interesting material that um, due to its durability is becoming more and more uh, commonly used. And it's also able to handle powders such as ceramic and, and glass. So I've got a quick SLS demo here as well. And just to show it's, you'll see some differences from the SLA printer because this will actually print um, right side up versus SLA printing upside down. But it's still pretty similar in terms of how it creates the product. Uh, for printing using SLA and DLP, um, the material runs, um, look real quick. It can be it, it can be a bit expensive if you're trying to print big things um, with with SLA. If you're trying to print small things, then it's not going to be too expensive. But the resin um, can definitely become costly over time. Let me look here. So what I'm finding is you can get one liter of SLA resin for about $50. Um, and then it'll just depend on the size of the print as to how much material, um, how much resin that would use, which would determine the ultimate cost of the print. So in terms of the cost of 3D printers normally, um, yeah, that's something I definitely I'm going to cover here in a second, um, a few in a few more slides. Um, SolidWorks or Inventor. Um, I tend to use Fusion 360 for all my work. Um, if I had to pick between SolidWorks or Inventor, I'd probably go SolidWorks. But I know there's people that like to use both. And there's, there's other 3D modeling uh, programs like Blender um, as well that people like to use. Um, so as I had alluded to, I was going to come back to um, to FDM printers. So the way FDM printers work is they take a thermoplastic uh, formed into a strand, generally referred to as filament, and much like the other print types, will add layers of a material. Um, and instead of a laser, it just uses the heat 
of the printer hot end uh, to fuse the material together. Uh, the thing with FDM that distinguishes it a little bit from SLA and um, and SLS is the wide range of materials that it has available to it. Uh, PLA, a, um, ABS, and PETG are generally used, um, are the most common thermoplastics that are used. Um, PLA is made from uh, made from cornstarch. So it's claimed to be biodegradable and, and all that, but some studies have shown that it's not as biodegradable as everyone seems to think it is. Um, but it is able to be um, put through a special machine that can break it down and um, turn it back into a, you know, a piece of filament that could be reused. So PLA is kind of the go-to filament uh, for most. And it does have some somewhat of those eco-friendly qualities about it versus the others. Um, Whereas ABS is completely chemically made, is not biodegradable, it'll last forever. Um, and PTG, same thing, chemically made, will last forever. Um, nylon, yeah, that won't you know, break down. Um, and it's a very difficult material to work with, work with that I found. Um, it's just got some weird properties to it that you have to use some special settings. Um, and same with carbon fiber and wood filament. Um, those are some different filaments that you can do some really cool things with them. Um, you can make some really strong parts, especially with nylon and, uh, and carbon fiber. Uh, wood is more, at least in my opinion, just kind of for show. Um, I've printed some stuff with wood before, and you can sand it just like it's a piece of wood. Um, if you, you know, knock on it, it sounds like a piece of wood, but it also has the um, likelihood of, of gumming up the printer's extruder. And then you have to take the extruder apart and clean it out and you know, restart. So it's, it's not too worth the hassle. Um, yeah, FDM printers are the most common 3D printers that you'll find for sale uh, because their designs are open source. So there are just so many companies that produce these printers. Um, a lot of them will have the same kind of base body style and then either sell them as is not modified or there's a couple companies that took the original design improve them in various ways and then sell those. Uh, the one downside of FDM printers is they can be painfully slow. I have had some prints that I've, I've been working on that one ran, I believe, 36 hours for a single print, and it was only half of the part. And I had to print two of them. So 72 hours to get one piece. It's uh, quite the it's quite the process. It was a pretty big part. It was about 12 and a half inches by 12 and a half inches, roughly, um, and about an inch thick. But yeah, FDM can definitely take time, uh, the bigger the parts are. So I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, what I'm going to do, let's see, hoping this works. Yeah, cool. It's been a while since I use Zoom, so bear with me one sec. So um, is everyone able to see my video and the presentation? 
I may need to stop the presentation for this. I'm gonna do that for a second. Yeah. Let's do this. There we go. Get the presentation out of the way for a second. Um, so what we've got on my uh, my video feed there is that is indeed a glass toys. Yep. Yeah, this is my uh, my office workshop prop costume room. So I store all my stuff in here. Um, the workshop I have my printers in. I'm renovating a little bit, so I brought the printer in here to demo. So yeah, Blastoise is uh he's making a cameo. <laughs> there we go. Um so what we've got here is one of my printers. Uh, this is the ANET A8. Um, it's an FDM printer, and I got this one a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a DIY kit that came in a bunch of parts. Had to go through the fun of assembling it, putting all the wires together, calibrating it, upgrading it. So what this printer does is it takes in the strand of filament we see here there's a roll um a roll of pla on the back of it and i've preloaded a model so on this guy you can just go through a couple settings um let's see need to reload the sd card and then on this one you'll be able to pick from all the models on the SD card. So it's just got to heat up a little bit. Um, and it thinks it's printing PTG for some reason. So we just fix that. I think it's print PTG. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'll leave this video feed up. And then as we continue on, um, we'll be able to see the printer start going. And then kind of by the end of the presentation, um, assuming that the printer works, because these things are, uh, they're imperfect machines. We'll be able to see the, um, the finished product, which is it's just going to be a simple cube. Um, but, you know, I wanted to show what, you know, an FDM printer looks like in action. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, so it doesn't, this one does not tell you how much time is left on a print. Um, this one. Well, it gives you it gives you a percentage, and it's a rough estimate from what I found because it's not it's not you know the most accurate, but it, it's close. And there are some that will tell you, and there it goes. They'll tell you a little more accurately, like you know, this has an hour left on it. So, yeah, this is just this was a a two hundred dollar kit. I bought on Amazon like several years ago. Um, so that's the one thing. The cheap printers, you're definitely not going to get, you know, the most features out of them. Um, yeah, this one was, was 200. I've got one that I bought from a, a different manufacturer that was about 600. And I had to do just a, a little bit of assembly on it but it also provides a lot more features. Um, there's a lot more ability to calibrate the settings in it. It has a feature to make sure the bed is perfectly leveled before it starts printing. It has 
the ability to continue where it left off if the power goes out, which was a huge blessing. Um, especially when I was working on like that 36 hour print, I was prototyping it. The power went out in about 20 hours. Um, it, just, it was just a, a flash, but it was enough to knock the printer offline. Um, it was able to pick up right where it resumed. Yeah, so there is there are printers with affordable, you know, they're affordable and decent quality. Um, I definitely I'm going to go over a couple of those. Um, I, I didn't want to just show. Oh, here's here's a 3D printer. Well, what if I want to get one? And I'm I'm going to trust. Me, I'm going to give you all you know as much information as I can. I got a couple more slides for sure. Yes, yeah, so I'll cover. Um, let me share my screen again. <laughs> I'm just, I'll skip around the slides because I have. Let's just let's do that. There we go. I choose the next one. Cool. Um, so a couple printers I've you know, I've done a little bit of research on them. A couple printers I think would be good, kind of entry level printers, and all three of these have roughly a seven by I think it's like a seven by eight by nine inch print area um, for all three of these and you'll see there's some different price points on these um, the Creality Ender 3 v2 and I want to make sure I call out the, the, the v2 part of it because Creality has been a company that um, has put out some really good printers over the last couple of years. Um, I've got their Ender 5 Plus out in my uh, main workshop. And it has a 13 by 13 by 15 inch print area. And it's, it's the one that was like $600 or so. And it's, it's a great printer. Um, and from what I've seen, the Ender, the original Ender 3 is really good as well, but they just recently made the V2. Um, and one of the benefits, it's mostly assembled. So for somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience with, um, you know, assembling a printer, getting a completely assembled or mostly assembled printer is probably best for them. Though, you know, if you really want a, a, a good, fun challenge, getting one that's assembly required is, uh, is definitely a challenge. Um, the first time I built one, it took me a couple evenings. Uh, now I can, I can build like an ANET or a, um, another printer like that that's fully assembly required in like five or six hours. So... <laughs> I definitely would say the Ender 3v2 or the ANET A8 Plus. Again, not the traditional ANET, which is what this guy is, the original ANET A8. Um, the Plus has added um, just some additional you know, quality of life features and just really improved the quality from the cheap acrylic frame, um, which I'm slowly replacing on it with an all metal frame. And the Ender 3 is an all metal frame out of the box. So, you know, if you're wanting to get into 3D printing, um, all three of these are FDM printers. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend getting an SLA printer right off the bat. They're really cool. But, you know, I think. You know, the, because the print area is so small on them and the resin, you know, it could be costly. I think FDM is probably the best starter set starter printers. So these would be probably my top three. And then at the bottom there, there's the original Prusa Mark III S Plus. It's fully assembled, but it's about $1,000. And in my opinion, it's worth the $1,000 price tag on it because um, Joseph Prusa, the, the genius behind 
the design of the i3. Um, he's added just some really, really great features to it. And um, what it offers, it's worth it, but it's, you know, it's got quite the steep price tag on it. So, yeah, I'd rec probably recommend the Ender for the ANET. Um, let's see. I'll go back to. So, one of the other things I wanted to, you know, go over with you all is um, some of the practical applications of 3D printing. So, as I had said, you know, I'm a prop and costume maker on the side, and that's that's all fun and, and good and whatnot. You know, you can use 3D printing for fun stuff, sure. But, you know, that, that's not everything about it. Um, you can use 3D printing for rapid prototyping, which is something a lot of companies do when they're designing a new product. Um, you can use a 3D printer, come up with a quick CAD design, and, you know, a little bit later, boom, rapid prototype, you can see what the product, what the new vehicle is going to look like, what the new, uh, the new Crescent Ranch or the new, you know, MacBook. I mean, you could, you could prototype so many things with that. Uh, one that I'm particularly a fan of is the medical applications of 3D printing. Researchers have actually been using stem cells to 3D print organs. They've done a heart, they've done an ear, and the ear they actually successfully transplanted onto the back of a lab rat and were able to keep the transplanted ear alive on the back of the rat. So it really could be an interesting thing in the future where we worry about um, organ donation and having the right match for somebody needing a, an organ transplant. This is the kind of thing that um, medical professionals could use a patient's own DNA and create a perfect match every time and not have to worry about an organ being rejected or you know, anything like that that could go wrong during an organ transplant with you know, getting it from a donor. Um, another fun one is automotive manufacturing. If you think of old vehicles, um, I know a few people that have, you know, antique, um, antique cars and a family friend of mine has has a I'm trying to remember what manufactured it is, but it's a really old car from the 1930s, and they're not going to make parts for that kind of car anymore. But if you could design the part, you could use um, like laser sintering and make a metal replacement of some of those parts. You know, if you need to replace something in the engine or maybe you use a flexible material to make um, a hose or something for the car that if you know there's some special need for that. So automotive manufacturers can use 3D printing and not even just discontinued parts, but for making parts of the future because there's less waste to it. Um, then one of the last ones is food. You can actually 3D print food, which is still, it still sounds crazy to this day, but there is a pancake 3D printer you can find on Amazon and a couple other sites. And there are pizza vending machines that um, you can go to 
and order a pizza at this vending machine and it will 3D print a pizza for you. The base, the sauce, the cheese, like it's it's crazy. And candies, that's that's a fun one. Um, there's companies and like small you know, candy shops that are 3D printing things like chocolate. So you can make custom chocolates, which are, which are pretty cool. Um, yeah, you can 3D print meats, you can 3D print you know, cakes. It's just, yeah, the, the applications for 3D printing really are limited by one's imagination at this point. The, the technology exists in its base form, and then it's just a matter of, you know, if I want to 3D print this, okay, what material do I need? Is there a printer that can handle this material? And it's just, you know, a matter of researching and then, you know, making that a reality. So it's a really cool thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead here. Um, and on top of getting a 3D printer, you know, if any of you do get one, um, a couple good sites to know are listed here um, because these sites have files you can get. You can find them. It's like a Google for 3D print files. Um, and you can find, you know, find them, download them. A couple of them have, have paid models, but you can find a lot of free models for stuff. And then you just plug them into a, to a printer and then off they go. So that's really it um, for what I have slide wise. So I'll go back to the, the video view here. Um, and what we can see is the, um, you know, the printer's still going along, kind of right in there. I had it set for my big printer, so that's why it's printing in the corner. Um, I didn't realize I didn't switch it back. So, but as we can see, it's just printing a relatively simple cube. Um, so does anyone have any other questions about 3D printing in general or different ways of going about it, um, things you can print, anything of that sort. Uh, what have I printed? Oh, <laughs> what haven't I printed? Let's see, yeah. My, my desk is full of my, my 3D prints, so let's see where's the, where's the webcam. So here's, one of the things of a uh, print is if we've got any, you know, last airbender fans out there printed this a while back. I had to print it in two parts, but it, uh, you know, I had to do two parts and fuse it together. But uh, it took, you yeah, had to do two prints. What's the last airbender? Oh. We'll have to introduce you to that after the uh, <laughs> after this. Um, yeah, the print took a while. It took probably eighteen hours ish. It was like nine hours per half um, for printing. Yeah, like a moving printing moving parts. Um, you'll have to um, You'll have to identify which parts are going to be moving and then make sure those are separated and really design the model in a way that you could put it back together so those parts are free to move. Um, if you're thinking like the wheels and an axle on a, on a car, you know, you want to make sure those parts are separated so it can rotate um, freely. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to split the parts if they don't fit. Um, there's an app called Mesh Mixer that I use that I can split models up um, into multiple parts that way. Um, makes it easy. And then also, this is a seven by seven by eight inch print area. And 
part of my problem was half of the split model. So that's why I bought my my bigger Ender 5 Plus that's double the print size of this thing. Um, for fusing it after, um, I use like a resin epoxy. I just go get it at like Home Depot or Walmart or you know, anywhere that sells like those adhesive, the construction grade adhesives. Um, and then I use a, an old soldering iron and old rolls of PLA um, to kind of solder it together, solder the, the two halves, just to really make sure it has a strong bond. Um, that's how I put most of my parts together. Um, and, you know, something else I'd made, which I had alluded to earlier in one of the questions. Can't, oh, can't do it in front of the web, webcam too well, but a, uh, a stormtrooper helmet. So, yeah, I'm one of the people that made them. <laughs> yeah, helmets are definitely a fun one to make because you have to use so many pieces and, you know, you have to use some of the epoxy and like soldering iron and PLA tricks to get them to stay together. Um, yeah, another fun one. Yep. I was working on a whole set of Halo armor a while back. Um, I've got a light up Iron Man helmet I printed. I can't remember where I put it. It might be out in the yeah i'm not sure where my print in my uh iron man helmet went by print that it lights up but i've got another one here and here's one that i grabbed to show because you know if you all get to 3d printing and really want to you know bridge 3d printing and some electronics tinkering this is going to be the project for you all. So if anyone's played Breath of the Wild, which I hope some, at least some of you have, it's just the best angle for it. There we go. So this is, you can, you know, bridge 3D printing with electronics. You know, and really challenge yourself. Like, don't just, 3D print something, you know, 3D print something and make it light up. Because everyone's like, wow, you 3D printed that? Yep. But hey, it lights up too. <laughs> you know, it's just a really cool thing to, to talk about. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely... Definitely a fun thing. So, like I said, 3D printing will let you take, I mean, you know, it's, it's really just how far does your imagination go? Um, you know, you, you make something and it's just, do you have electronics to it? Do you paint it? Do you, I don't know, throw it off the top of a building and see, test its durability. I mean, there's, <laughs> You know, so many, so many different things you can do with 3D printing, just with the plastics. And then, like I said, you know, food and all that. Um, question from the Twitch chat, is there a... Yeah, so there's a couple different, um, a couple different programs that you can use for 3D printing. Um, I'll show one of them real quick. Let me zoom over there. Uh, let's see, share screen. There we go. Yeah, so this is um, Cura by Ultimaker. Uh, this is generally what I use to slice and configure um, the models that I print. It's just one of the easiest, you know, in my opinion, most user-friendly um, applications to take a STL file, um, bring it into here, and you can configure just a whole wide range of settings um, on how to print this. And 
you can preview what it'll look like. Um, like what the printer, like each layer is gonna look like. So let me zoom in some. So this is where you kind of can see how 3D printing does it layer by layer is it'll start with the, the, the build platform. And then as you, you know, get that first layer printed, the printer then goes up and then, you know, it'll, you know, you can kind of preview what the printer does as like each layer. And then at the end, you know, you have a finished product. Chat though. I lost the chat. Yeah. yeah, so this is the this is what I'd use to you know get a, a printer a, a 3D print on. And it'll tell you roughly how long it'll it'll be. Um, it, it's a pretty rough estimate. And then a rough estimate of the cost, which you have to configure like what the cost of the roll of material is and it'll it'll tell you roughly how much it uses. Um, so you have two options um, really when it comes to you know figuring out what you want to build. You'll either have to design it um, in um, in an app, a CAD app like Fusion 360 or, um, or um, Inventor or SketchUp, or you can find models on sites like Thingiverse um, or My Mini Factory that um, you can download the pre-designed models to print. So it just depends on, you know, what you're needing. If, if you can find the model for what you want to print, you know, then that's definitely some effort saved. But if you need something custom, like, um, what would be a good example? Well, let's say you want, you want to do a place like the knob on knob or, you know, something like that on an oven, which I've seen that done. You know, if you can find the right oven knob, you know, you could just download that model and print in, pop it around your oven. But if you've got a, you know, a strange oven that, you know, the model may not exist for that knob, um, that might be something that you'd need to model out and then, you know, get it configured for printing. It just depends on you know, what you're trying to do. So where are we at? It's about, yeah, the print's about 70% through now. Um, I know the, the LCD screen's kind of blown out on the video feed. So yeah, it's about 70% through, but it's almost there. Um, so does anyone, anyone have any other questions on, on 3D printing? Um, yeah, you, you, um, yes, yeah, so if you got one like the, the Ender 3, um, which has roughly the same print area as this one, um, yeah, you'd be able to, um, to print helmets. So that's actually what I printed. Okay, I think I print both my helmets on on the on um, my A net here. I tried to slice them up. Uh, I think the Halo helmet model. That's when I found online it was already pre-sliced into into parts. The Stormtrooper one, I think I had to slice on my own, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, you'd, you'd be able to to split them into different parts using like mesh mixer. Um, and then, you know, using epoxy or 
PLA bulb it with a, a soldering iron um, and, and put them together when they were all printed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, the, the durability really depends on the material, um, and some of the settings that you use. PLA tends to be pretty durable as long as you're not trying to do anything too crazy with it. Um, you know, I've definitely dropped my helmets a couple times and the swords drop, gotten dropped. And they hold up pretty well. Um, but the thing with that is you also have to make sure that the uh, the thickness of the part is sufficient as well. Um, so that would bring into play some of the, the settings in Ultimaker's Cura. Um, as long as you have a, a thick enough shell and enough infill, then the parts are pretty durable. But if you have a part that maybe only has um, like one, one wall on the outside of it, so it would be a very thin outer shell um, and then not a lot of infill, if you drop that part or say try to squeeze it in your hand, yeah, it, it wouldn't be very durable. But, you know, I've got just some dummy parts here, for example. Um, you know, if I squeeze it, I'm squeezing pretty hard. You know, it's, it's not going to break. But I've had parts that have been come out brittle. Um, is this terrible? Yeah, or if you have parts with like, like thin kind of ends on them, um, those would be the places that the print would probably break. But like overall, I mean, even this one, it's it's pretty durable. Yeah, it just you know depends on the material. Um, you know, if you use carbon fiber, it's gonna be durable. If you use nylon, it's it's it, it should be pretty durable. Um, ABS is, is pretty durable, but it's terrible to print with. It's just very it's very. You have to make sure that the temperature around the printer is perfect, and there's like no draft, no no breezes or dra air drafts blowing through. But it's it's pretty durable too. Yeah, I, think, I don't know if they have done large sculptures on the 3D printer. Um, but actually, now that you asked that, hmm, I got one more thing I could show here um, that I didn't think of earlier. I got really uh, another really cool use for uh, 3D printing. Let me see if I can find that video real quick. to show you all. Is this the one? Um, yeah, so I don't, like I said, I don't know if anyone's done sculptures, but let's see. Awesome, they haven't demoed it. One thing that, um, some companies have started to do is 3D print with cement. And it, okay, I think I found the uh, video here. Let's see. Nope, that's not it. Yeah, so they're using uh, 3D printed cement, um, 3D printing and, and cement as the material to print um, really small houses, which that's something they could use um, in like natural disaster scenarios. Um, so if 
you know, a hurricane comes through or a tornado comes through, um, you know, and houses are destroyed, you could have a group come in and, you know, effectively build rapid emergency housing. Uh, it takes about 10 hours per house right now is what they said, but you could build you know, a bunch of emergency housing for people while they try and, uh, you know, get the natural disaster cleaned up. Um, I don't know if you could build a giant blasters carbon fiber statue. I mean, if you had a big enough printer, yeah, you, you definitely could. I mean, the, the cost of that would be outrageous. Because uh, the thing with, one of the things with the, with the cost of, of um, FDM printers, at least, is the roll of filament on the back of it. Um, so that, you know, this roll here is like 15 to 20 bucks, depending on where you buy it. And it's about two pounds of, of uh, PLA to get um, a roll of carbon fiber PLA, because um, it won't be 100% carbon fiber, they infuse the carbon fiber uh, into the PLA generally. Let's see, one roll of carbon fiber. Let's see, it's, it's expensive from what I remember. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think, I think a Blastoise uh, statue would be fun. I mean, I've taken, I've taken Blastoise to conventions and worn it around and stood really still in places where there was a lot of foot traffic and people thought that it was a statue and then I'd wait for a while and people would do something like poke the arm and I'd jump scare them. It was great. Hey, the print's done. Let me give that a second to cool. No, oh, no, didn't even need to cool. So yeah, so over the course of the roughly 30 minutes, and I'm just gonna pull the little brim material off. This is used to help hold the print, you know, to the bed, get rid of that. But in about 30 minutes, little calibration cube. So it's got X, Y, Z, so you can just you can see like which um, you know, access it printed on. I didn't want to do anything too crazy. I want to make sure it would be done in time. Um, yeah, so that looks like it takes us right up to the uh, end of the end of the presentation here. So I you know, appreciate everyone hopping on and asking questions. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you think of uh, additional questions, you know, feel free to shoot me a message on Discord. Um, you know, I'll definitely try and answer those questions. You know, I'm terribly enthusiastic about 3D printing, and I could, I could probably give an entire like day's workshop lecture on on 3D printing. So, you know, if y'all got questions or you know, look for resources, you know, I'm in the uh, the Code Day Discord there. So. Yeah. But again, you know, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. And just remember, have fun out there. And if you get a 3D printer, it'll be worth it. <laughs>